this computer. Okay, we are recording. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, James Lynn is letting people in as we speak. I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, today's panel, online panel discussion entitled uh, Newish Applications of AI, Artificial Intelligence in Content Creation and Localization. Seems to be a very hot topic these days. We have a lot of people signed up. Um, we're also recording this session. So if you have to leave early, do not worry. We'll send a link to the recording, uh, hopefully before the end of the week. Um, well, I think we'll introduce ourselves, but I'm super excited for uh, James Lynn, Senior Localization Operation Program Manager at Uber to join me as a moderator for this session. And then of course, uh, having Heather Shoemaker of Language IO, Andy Sidron, you're gonna pronounce your name correctly, of XTM International and Istvan Lengiel. Again, Istvan, I uh, hope you'll be able to pronounce your name correctly. Uh, of Nimzi and Be Lazy here. You guys are experts in this field as well. James, I wrangled you into this conversation because I'm more a, a global digital marketing expert. I used to be in the localization industry for about 12 years. Uh, my name is Chris Ralph. I'm with Boulder SEO Marketing. So I'm still very much involved in the localization industry, but I talk more about international global SEO. Uh, so this topic is um, it's a little bit different than what I usually talk about. With that being said, James, I think I'm going to hand it over to you and I'll take over uh, letting people into this meeting. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much. And um, hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome, welcome. I'm James and I'll be co-moderating with Chris. A quick introduction to myself and my background is that I am the senior operation localization program manager at Uber. Um, you know, I've been in this industry, internationalization and localization for over 18 years combined uh, totals. Um, and you know what, currently I'm still fascinated with what's going on out there, especially the topic that Chris just introduced. It's just mind blowing. The what and the how's made me wondering every day when I come to work on what's next. And I'm sure that people that are joining this call who dial in for all of the country, United States, UK, EMEA, APJ, whatnot, want to know what is, what is this artificial intelligence or machine learning and its content creation process for? Um, you know, how does AI help? Um, you know, does AI provide this reliable content that we could trust one day? Not yet we can't or can we trust? <laughs> Right? That's the question that you guys will be asking us, hopefully by so many questions. Uh, without any biases or offensive wars or even slogan towards our current society, not just from a marketing perspective, uh, but the contents that everybody produce uh, for social networking, user-generated contents, so we're living now. In order to have check and balance, let's have our first and you know, our panelists to discuss this topic in more detail. Uh, let's have each panelist introduce themselves, please. Um, let me first have Heather, please, to introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you, James, for the intro. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you to all of the participants for attending today. I'm expecting this to be an interesting and fun panel. I'm Heather Shoemaker, CEO of Language.io. Language.io provides multilingual customer support technology. My background is both on the linguistics and the software development side. I um, have worked as a software developer on a natural language processing platform and focused on data normalization. I have also worked as an internationalization engineer, traveling all over the world, helping companies internationalize or refactor their source code so that their software can support multiple languages. And the interesting thing that I discovered as an internationalization engineer is that when a company goes global, the biggest challenge that they face is not what people think of immediately. It's not translating your user interface or your marketing collateral or even Unicode enabling your database platform. The biggest challenge that companies face when they go global is in providing consistent customer support in multiple languages. If you think about it, you've got this huge knowledge base of support articles that is basically held captive inside of the customer support management platform. 
and you need a process for translating and then maintaining the translation of that content. But even more challenging are the massive volumes of support tickets and chats that are coming in in many languages. And companies are faced with this dilemma. Do we hire native speaking support agents for every language that we need to support? Or is there some kind of technology that can provide real-time translation and empower our existing support agents to support customers in any language? And I eventually found myself in a position to tackle this challenge. And um, alongside my colleague, Karna Kulvik, we founded Language.io, and we have provided the latter technology that relies on all sorts of machine learning and natural language processing and AI to provide real-time translation so that existing support agents can support customers in any language. We've tackled this problem in a unique way. Like I mentioned, when you're handling massive volumes of support chats coming in every day, if you're not accurately translating a company's product names, industry jargon, or UI labels, the support agent and the customer will not understand each other. And that's going to result in a lot of lost revenue for the customer, which nobody thinks is funny. So. Like I said, we've, at we've attacked this problem in a unique way to provide accurate real-time translation of support chats and emails. And one of our partners in this space is XTM, which in conjunction with the Taos Data Quality Framework provides our machine learning models with a form of supervised learning, um, which is edit distance data. So at this point, I will hand the baton over to Andy of XTM. Hi. Hi everyone. Many thanks, Heather. Many thanks, James. Many thanks, Chris. Um, my name is Andre Zidrin. Um, I'm CTO co-founder of XCM International. Um, I've spent 45 years in IT, um, 30 of those um, in conjunction with localization. I've worked for Xerox Corporation, for Ford Motor Company Europe, and for Oxford University Press, amongst others. So I have a big enterprise um platform background you know designing for scale um, and reliability um, today i'll be talking about some very exciting new um developments in the cognitive linguistic ai field um called interactive language sorry interlanguage vector space um, very very exciting very new um, with massive amounts of potential. So I'll hand back to James. Thank you, thank you so much, Andy. Now, um, Ishvan, uh, could you also please introduce, introduce yourself? Thank you. Absolutely, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here, but also thank you everyone for joining this. So my name is Ishvan and I wear two hats and I'm working on the one hand with NIMSI Insights as a technology consultant and this is the head in which I'm working with enterprises and I'm working with uh, Be Lazy, which I am also the founder of uh, on supply chain automation. And there I'm working mostly with uh, language uh, service providers. Like I've been also in the industry for, whew, like depends on what you call the industry, but with translation, it's been 22 years by now. And uh, many of you know me from, uh, from Mem MemoQ times, which is where I spent probably the longest time. And then uh, I recently take a, have taken an interest in something that has been very long in my mind, like providing equal value to translators, LSPs, and enterprises. But previously, it was more like just to be fair and just to everyone, if, uh, independent of their size. But today, what I see is that a lot of companies are moving into things like continuous localization. And process becomes king because these processes need to be much more coordinated, much more harmonized than before. So I've taken like a keen interest in, in helping everybody uh, in improving their processes. And one of the things that's uh, probably very relevant here is that everybody provides a lot of data. And uh, there is a lot of process related data as well as there is a lot of language related data. And what we need to see is how everybody in the in the supply chain everybody in in the value chain is able to take the most out of this and from my perspective i would like to address the the issue of how the uh, process data can be turned to value in companies of any size 
Awesome. And then James, for, sorry, before I hand it back to you to get this conversation started, I'd like to encourage uh, our attendees to submit questions uh, through the Q&A or the chat interface. And then uh, James, you and I, let's keep an eye on those questions. If there are any you know, questions that we should answer right away, let's do that. Otherwise, let's uh, make sure we have a little bit of time at the end to address some of these questions. It's a very hot topic. We could talk about this for hours and hours. So, um, you know, let's do our best and let's, uh, let's answer what we can answer or, uh, you know, encourage people to uh, think about this in more depth. James, over to you. All right, thank you. So, you know what, let's start with um, Heather, right? You know, that's the first topic, topic of user-generated content. You know, first question, maybe we can start off is, you know, if you could, right, focus on the artificial intelligence and machine learning, how does this sort of, you know, platform or sort of software is helping the digital content and user-generated con content for your company? Like, for example, how does this machine learning play a huge role in defining what content is, like published content, CRM, et cetera, or how to gatekeep those hate speeches and cultural elements that has offensive and, har and harmful content? How do you support that? How do you really, you know, define that within the company of yours, that is? Oh, you're, you're muted, Heather. Sorry. You'd think I had figured that out by now. I've only been in a few <laughs> Zoom meetings. Um, yeah, so starting with the offensive content and hate speech, I think a lot of different components in the customer support world are tackling that challenge today. So CRMs themselves have lots of filters in place to prevent offensive words and hate speech from even getting to the support agents, definitely not in the other direction. Um, and platforms like Sistran, machine translation platforms, are also developing all sorts of mechanisms for detecting that content and doing whatever it is that you need to do with that content, preventing it from being passed along. Um, as far as employing machine learning and AI to properly translate user-generated content, which was one of your questions, right, James? There were a few of them in there. Um, Language.io has tackled this in a unique way. So we started out tackling this problem the same way that everybody in the industry tackles real-time conversational translation, which is to train a neural machine translation engine for every language for each of our customers. And what we discovered early on was that this is a really expensive, time-consuming way to get accurate translation of B2B, you know, company-specific content. It wasn't it was taking too long to onboard customers. So we've taken a unique approach here, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds on it or take up too much time, but um, if I break it into its components, the first thing that we do is we intelligently select the best machine translation engine for each piece of content as it hits our platform, but a general engine. So we have, like a few other companies in the industry, a machine translation aggregation layer. So if we're gonna pick the best engine for the language pair, and as, as we all know, different MT engines do a better job with different language groups. So that's where we start. And then from there, we have unique technology that will impose a company's preferred translations for these problematic terms, named entities like product names, um, industry jargon, and UI labels. You can imagine the mess you get yourself in if you're not properly translating a company's UI labels and you're in a customer support situation. But the most exciting thing and the last piece of our stack that I wanted to mention that employs machine learning in a unique way is what we're calling the self-improving glossary, which we're releasing this year, which will proactively detect terms for our, our customers that require a special translation that shouldn't have a general translation. And we do this through a combination of different feedback loops coming in from translation quality ratings to the edit distance data that I mentioned on our MTPE projects all sorts of cool things that we're doing to identify anomalous content in chats and emails as it hits our platform and then propose unique translations for these problematic terms that we've identified. And this keeps us from a scenario where our customers have to come to us and say, hey, language IO, bad translation of this term. Um, this term needs to be translated differently for our company or our industry. Instead, we're proactively finding those terms um, and proposing unique translations for our, 
our customers. James, did that answer some of your question? Yeah, I think that really helps. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, my pleasure. And in towards that direction, right? You know, when we since we talk about machine translation and neural machine translation, right? You know, all the data has to fit into that for translation, terminology, and all that stuff. The question that I'm sure everybody's mind is that I'm sure there'll be error comes in and somehow sneak into when training this neural machine translation. Is there a way to prevent that or correct it automatically from your view, Heather's? Um, so yeah, when, when you're training a neural machine translation engine, that's one of the biggest challenges, right? Because maintaining that, tra that training over time is pretty labor intensive. You can't just train an engine and then call it good for the rest of your existence. You have to maintain that, which is why we've gone away from the formal training process. And we've employed these new techniques to, let's say that they're there's new slang invented. This just happened to us recently where there was new slang invented in China. And we start getting this term that none of the engines know what to do with, right? Because it's brand new. So we've been employing these machine learning techniques and natural language processing techniques to um, detect terms that are anomalous in some fashion that don't fit the pattern that we would expect and then when we get enough negative feedback on chat translations associated with this new term in conjunction with other feedback that comes into our system, it is escalated to our linguists and, sorry, phone. Um, okay. <laughs> I know, right, that's not supposed to happen. Uh, and it's escalated to our linguists and then we provide proactively a fix for that problem that has popped into our system. Wow, 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 that's awesome, that's awesome. And you know what, you know, during my introduction, I mentioned about slogan, jargon, those, you know, paraphrase that, you know what, we, you know, people that speak English have different jargon that we introduce ourselves every day when we're talking to our clients, you know, internal um, logos and etc. You know, it, since it's been invented on a daily basis, not just in English, but in different languages, you know, that very, that makes it very difficult to train and to basically feed this information back to the neural machine translation. You know, Absolutely. You know, you, right? How does this machine learning in this case to um, use to identify those sort of slang translation that, you know, to support this neural machine translation on the fly? Yeah. So that's a great question. And I think people sometimes forget that it's not just English or your language that's constantly inventing these acronyms. For example, if you have kids, you've got all sorts of chat acronyms that they're using that you don't even understand. But let's use some basic ones like LOL or IDK. These come up every day. They do in China as well. We just got one coming in GKD that means do it quickly. Um, so the just to simplify it, the way that we detect new terms that require special handling is relatively unique. But um, so, for example, one way we might do this is we do analyze every chat email that hits our platform for translation, and we employ natural language processing techniques to identify things like non-dictionary terms, named entities, terms that aren't in any glossary or any dictionary, right? And that doesn't, if we find a term like that, that doesn't mean it's instantly going to become a glossary term and have a special translation. But we keep track of instances of GKD, let's say, popping into translations. And then another thing that Language.io provides is a mechanism by which um, people who receive our translation, so in the customer support world, that would be a customer or an agent, they have the ability to rate the quality of translation for each chat or email that they see. And when these named entities or non-dictionary terms keep popping up and they hit a certain threshold in conjunction with the negative feedback coming from this, this supervised learning feedback loop that we have um, from a number of different directions, that will put it on our radar and push it to the level that tells Language.io this term, GKD, has, enough, has seen enough usage in conjunction with enough negative feedback that it requires a special translation. Does that answer your question, James? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, your machine learning is able to pick that up as a data and able to retrain that and feed that information back, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And you know what, this is a good segue to machine learning because I know that Andy from the XTM has been working on this mind-blowing 
the next big thing that we call it that Andy want to discuss this, but I would like, I want, I wouldn't, you know, take over, you know, his side. So I want Andy to take over on discussing what this next big thing is. Please, Andy. Okay, many thanks, James. Um, right at the beginning, um, let's start. Um, in 2013, Google Research published a paper um, called Vector Space. Um, what they did, this was Thomas Mikulov and his team, they took the Google News Corpus and they pushed it through a massive neural transit, sorry, a neural engine. And they allocated 300 vector values, these are trigonometric values, to each word um, in the corpus. And what it does is it actually calculates what the following words are according to the current word and what the most probable word in the current context is given the surrounding words. So this gives you a very detailed way of associating words amongst themselves. So we know language is uniquely human. It's not a scientific notation. It only makes sense in a human context. And as Heather's pointed out, it's constantly changing. But you can actually find amazing hidden meanings through this. So what you can do, given these vector values, is you can actually query um, logical questions. So you can say, well, if Einstein's a scientist, then who is Mozart? Um, um, or what is Lionel Messi? It's quite amazing. Not only that, but you can actually say, are apple fruit or vegetables? Um, you can actually come up with a whole list of what are types of fruit, whether they are um, fruits that you can, um, that are low lying like berries or apples and pears. It, it is truly amazing. You can also do things like work out um, adverbs from adjectives like quick and quickly. Um, you can work out plurals, um, irregular plurals like mouse and mice. Um, and you can work out opposites, um, transient, intransient, and things like that. So um, where can that take us? Well, Facebook looked at this and said, wow, this is mind blowing. So what the research group headed by Piotr Boyanowski um, at Facebook did, was actually apply that to the whole of the internet. They took a trawl, crawl of the whole of the internet and produced what effectively is a language model for each language. Obviously there are languages that have more and certain languages, uh, minority languages will have much less exposure on the internet. But if you can take the English language, um, the amount of material on there from Middle English, you know, Chaucer, through Shakespeare, through everything that's been published. It is petabytes of data. Um, you can create a comprehensive language model. Now, this is what sets it apart from, say, neural machine translation engines. They are trained on a given corpus for a specific purpose with a specific vocabulary. With vector space, the training is done on a comprehensive total corpus of data. So we're talking about, you know, tens of thousands of words that are typically appear in the language and the relationships between those words. So that is brilliant. But what can we do with that data? Well, a group at Babylon um, Health actually took up the challenge and looked at the individual vector spaces. Now, each language produces a unique vector space. Um, they aren't comparable. It's like a fingerprint. So each language has, because languages vary in grammar, in morphology, etc. they all produce different fingerprints. Um, they hinted at the way that you can actually normalize. You can take two languages, and actually flatten the representation so that they can overlap directly. And this is what we've been doing. 
um, we've actually produced a way of normalization so that you can now specifically take that kind of intelligence which I've described and apply it on a bilingual basis. So what use is it and how does it differ from neuro machine translation? A neuro machine translation is brilliant. It's a fantastic um, technology, um, but it's a black box. Um, so when it produces its output, you know nothing about the sequence of words or what they are. It basically comes out of a, a black box at the end and, and that's it. What you can do, and we're only at the beginning, we're beginning to, we're only starting to scratch the surface of ILVS. Um, what we can do is we can now peek into um, a specific target language version of a source segment. So we can actually pick apart which words, which phrases go with which. It's a very exciting time. Uh, we, we're calling it um, cognitive linguistic AI. Um, it, it, we're right very at the very, very beginning. What we're doing with it in XTM is a number of things. First of all, we're doing bilingual terminology extraction. So when you do terminology extraction, obviously you do it on the source language. Um, we have now, since the release in June, started doing bilingual terminology extraction. That means taking the identified terms in the source language with an aligned corpus, and we can identify what the target terms are. Um, this, you know, reducing the amount of words, sorry, work that um, linguists have to do when creating terminology. Um, we do 80% of the work for them. We produce the, the context, um, and the target and all of the surface forms as well. Because what we do with um, ILVS is also use morphology. All of the morphological reduction stemming, so we identify all of the various surface forms for morphologically rich languages, all of the grammatical forms, the genders, etc., and then present that to the terminologists so that they can actually have a final run through. The other thing that we're doing is automatic placement of inline elements. Now to do that, you need to kind of work out um, for both human translation and for neural, for machine translation, which words, uh, which phrases um, go which, um, with the source inline elements. So we're aiming, uh, we've achieved about 80 to 90% success rate in automatic placement of inline elements. The other thing we're doing is our aligner um, has been uh, acknowledged by the vast majority of our especially LSP customers as one of the best on the market. Uh, we've enhanced that. Um, the aligner was always based on lexicon, so we're enhancing the aligner to use interactive language, sorry, interlanguage vector space um, to do that. Um, lots of interesting challenges um, ahead. Um, ones that Hev has mentioned, you know, how do we add new words? How do we train new words um, to add into the ILVS for the languages? Um, and how we can actually make further use. We're planning to use dynamic subsegment matching, so we can actually not only work out words but also phrases dynamically as from both the translation memory and as the translator is translating interactively, we can work those out. Um, we can also do clever things like spot mistakes or errors. Um, we can highlight for post-editing purposes most prob probable mistranslations or um, where a post-editor should be looking at which segments are suspect. Um, we can also work out automatically the quality output from machine translation engines. So which ones are creating you know, the, the best output linguistically. So very, very exciting time. Um, it's, as I mentioned, we're only at the very beginning. Um, the next couple of years are going to be really key. We have a, a great team um, in XCM um, headed up by Dr. Rafał Jaworski, 
uh, most of this work is his. Um, and um, yeah, very, very exciting times. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. This is awesome, right? I mean, you guys heard about this inter-language vector space. It's, and the, the, the application that is about to, to utilize, you know, what Andy mentioned about the bilingual term extraction, dynamic sub-segment matching, all those are valid points. The question that I think that audience might want to know is that it's based on this whole IL, <clears throat> VT, or VS is based on probability and predicting. How does this probability and prediction works? Like for example, right, in what threshold does the probability have to reach in order for you to know that, you know what, this translation is not correct or this translation is correct? Okay, you can actually set the thresholds. Um, they're, they're quite amazing um, to see. I, I keep on using the phrase magical. Um, when you see it in, in action, <laughs> um, it can work out synonyms and various things. So if someone has had something like savage and it's been translated as wild, um, it can work out the probabilities. The, typically, it's around 0 0.45. So the probability values are zero to one, where one is absolute probability, zero is absolutely not probable. Um, typically anything over 0.45 is significant, although you can actually vary it depending on the type of application that you're doing. So say for high quality alignment, I normally have it at 0.45, but say for um, bilingual terminology extraction, I'll reduce that to 0.8, sorry, 0.18. Um, so I reduce it lower, so that gives me more candidates, and then I can filter the candidates out to look for repetitions, the common repetitions within the translation. So it is tunable, um, and that's one of its strengths. Um, you can set it according to the specific requirements. So it's like a, a, an instrument that you can just adjust the settings according to your output requirements. One of the things I haven't, I forgot to mention in my previous kind of description was also using it for type ahead because we know the context. We can actually predict the context of the next words that are coming up probably um, and to help the translator. So that's gonna come in in 2021. So there's a whole roadmap of uh, very exciting things in the pipeline. Yeah, that's a good point, right? You know, because predictive typing from a source, which is, you know, all the content author enter the content and then the translator have to use that content and translate that. But more often than not, at least at Uber, we experience that, you know, not all contents create equally. Some content is mismatched, correct and correct spelling, grammatical errors, just a lot of things that we have to feed that information back to our translator that, hey guys, Sorry, we have to talk to our stakeholder. This content needs to revise. So we are working what we call a you know a source content profiling. So your predicted typing, you say that it will help, but then for a wide spectrum, how does it support and how does it help our content author to generate the content that can feed that information to machine translation? They have a higher probability to have a better translation output and less post editing. Uh, absolutely, uh, from. 30 years ago, when I started with localization, um, it became apparent to me very much that the quality of the translation depends on the quality of the source. Um, if it's garbage in, you get garbage out. I remember sitting in Xerox, uh, my head in my hands, uh, looking at, uh, this was a, a something done by a large American automotive company. Um, it was a paragraph and um, the translators had come back to me and said this doesn't make sense and i kind of read this and reread it and reread it and it didn't make sense um at all um so it is very very important to be able to control the source um there are a number of techniques around this and one of them is used in the airline industry which is the um ata 1000 you know you um, have a prescriptive um, vocabulary. You know, uh, a hammer can only mean either a noun or a verb, but not both. Um, in terms of something like interactive vec language, sorry, into language vector space, um, it's a matter of being able to kind of focus the algorithms 
so that they are attuned to the actual text that's coming in. ILVS can also work on bigrams and trigrams, so it can actually cope and spot spelling mistakes, um, which is a kind of important aspect. Um, it's something we would love to investigate um, and see how we could actually use that. Um, it, there are so many, it's, it's like a, a new tool and you are looking for all of the possible <laughs> ways you could use it. Yeah. Uh, but watch the space. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like a new toy, right? Once you have a new toy, I want to play with it more. Sorry, yeah. Chris. <laughs> James, uh, sorry, before we loop Istvan in, Istvan, we're already 35, so 36 minutes into the talk. Uh, we have a good question, I think, uh, from Miklos. Uh, these great application ideas to use neural based systems in localization environments. How do you get the data to train these applications? What are the biggest obstacles to collect this data? Maybe uh, a quick answer. I think we're already starting to run out of time here. Uh, you can crawl the whole internet. That's uh... internet is big, big data. It's big, it's big, <laughs> <laughs> and it's free, and it's there. Yeah. Uh, so that's one answer. <laughs> that's a quick answer. Love it. Awesome. So you know what? That's a great segue to moving to each one, right? You mentioned about, and we all mentioned about the workflow from the content creation process down to CMS, to TMS, and the translator get their translation done, feedback back to CMS. The entire workflow is mind-boggling. So many pieces, so many processes, and so many workflows. In each one, you know, I know that, you know, your company in what you do is to basically evangelize and optimize this workflow. Can you talk a bit more about your ideal scenario? And then the second thing is, how does this, how does this AI and ML fit into this entire workflow that you have in mind? Yeah, I think, I think in this industry, so it's a bit different from uh, what Heather and Andy were doing because there is an amazing uh, discovery made by mankind a few thousand years ago, which is helping language related machine learning it is the notation of it that is called writing and it's just great that you know you can describe any kind of spoken utterance in some sort of a writing and it's it's uh, well described and this is what you're working with so this data is readily available now the problem is that there is no equivalent for processes like what is the step in a process i mean you can build uh, flow charts but probably the way you would build flowcharts are very different from the way I would build flowcharts, like the, the granularity, what's important there. And this is the, the thing that, that we see a lot of times, like uh, how hard it is to really capture what is a process. At the same time, uh, we are talking about multinationals having struggles and so on and so forth, which is not a rare thing, uh, because of the lack of uh, agreed processes. And then you think about the translation industry, and you mentioned a lot of like a lot of CMSs, content types, whatever, whatever. You didn't mention the number of emails that get sent in this process. I mean, that is mind boggling. And what uh, I find is that the, this industry is built on email. It's like we can pretend that we've got systems and we've got data and everything, but in reality, I mean, most people, like how many times did I see even the enterprise customer sending emails that this and this is ready. There is a click, like you can just move from uh, like under preparation to the status ready and it would work perfectly well, but somehow there is a control. There is a lot of pressure on people and there is a lot of pressure on, on project managers. And it seems that the only way of communication so far is email. And actually this is the only reason why I believe that uh, project management is, uh, is very complicated in, in companies. And, because it's like, as the lower you are in the supply chain, so let's say you are a translator or you are a single language vendor, the more emails you get uh, and the more different uh, like workflows you get. So for example, today I was talking to one company that is getting the same end customers translations from one uh, multilingual vendor and another multilingual vendor. The two, they are really hard to harmonize. It's the same content type from the same customer and customer, but still people have devised very different ways. And this is why I think that we've got a bit of a, a handicap here when we're talking about the process automation as opposed to the language automation, because 
we are simply not easily understanding what's the process. And one of the questions that I'm asking uh, people usually is just tell me like, what systems does, uh, does your content come from? What is the format of your content? And usually I just mean like, is it a source file? Is it a string? Is it a translation package? Or do you have to work online? And like how many tasks you need to do regarding this? And then just define what's a task, of course. That is also not, not a very easily available uh, thing. And, and like what's your revenue coming through this stream? And we don't think in streams. And I think that, that is, uh, what is a, what is a big issue at the moment. So when I'm talking to companies, what, what I usually try to preach is get your reporting right. And the only reason why I'm saying this is that uh, for reports, you use data. And your reporting is right if you can understand that data and you are able to, uh, to make decisions based on those reports. So, so what I'm thinking is that reporting is a very good starting point to do because that is giving you the high level understanding of what's happening. There will be points that you don't understand. When you start a new report, there will be always be a cleaning necessary. And this is the cleaning that we have not been doing because we trusted people a bit too much on this, that they keep things under control. But then when it comes to scalability, this is becoming a bottleneck because people can keep a number of things. I mean, I remember most of the daily agenda that I'm going to do, but I don't remember next week's agenda that I agree with people on. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. This is awesome, right? You know, like since like, you know, we all as LSP from I'm sure audiences here that we are, you know, presenting, you know, one of the questions that I think is that if you are an LSP, uh, should you or we starting using, you know, sort of AI machine translation for like project management today? Like what's your take on this, Ishvan? I mean, for like machine learning, not machine translation. Machine learning, uh, yes, yes. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that there's a possibility that this can be useful. But on the other hand, what I feel and uh, like, I think that here in the team, I am probably the least technical of us. Uh, but I am not a mathematician nor a marketer, so I'm somewhere in between <laughs> trying, to, trying to understand the high seas of uh, machine learning. But basically what I think is that you can only use machine learning if you're able to define your processes. So if there is a notation for your process, there is an understanding of how you go from one process to another, there's a lot of uh, interest in that. And I believe that, that uh, if you're able to categorize your streams, which is basically, let's call your, your work streams, like how the work is coming in, then there is already a good opportunity to start looking into machine translation, uh, <laughs> machine learning, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, doing Andy's mistakes now, <laughs> like walking the, the wrong thing. Uh, so that, that, is, that is something when after that you're able, like machine learning is able to find out the outliers. I mean, what you're looking at is automating what is standard and finding the outliers and pushing the outliers to a, to a human uh, decision. And very often the interesting thing is that this is just changing the work, work that project managers work. This is not like, it's, it's not taking away the work from the project mm. managers. Mm. What it is doing is that project managers became like, like, uh, like harmonization champions. I mean, they start working more with the customer and also highlighting what are those things that are actually coming from the customer as, as things that are not ideal. They are trying to, uh, to understand the holistic process. So it's, it's a bit more thinking work then shuffling files and sending emails. But I think that this is uh, something that a lot of companies would like to move into because there is always like a temporary advantage for, for every company over others in, if they are following certain trends that prove to be good. And I certainly hope that this is proving to be good. I see, I see. And yeah. now you mentioned and discussed this whole other side of spectrum or PM side. Of course, the other side of spectrum is our beloved, awesome, respected translators, right? I'm sure all some translators are also on a call as well, that if we use machine translation or machine learning, what's wrong with machine translation, but machine learning to support all of the end-to-end -end workflow, 
Can translator availability be addressed by machine learning, Ishvan? I mean, this is something that we are looking into because what we are providing is, what we've seen is that no matter how big a company you are, the problem with a freelance translator is that it's a freelance translator. So by definition, a freelance translator works for more than one customer. An in-house translator's availability, absolutely. Uh, there is no problem. But uh, what we have understood is that obviously that is a very, very important factor, how much work you are doing for the others. Because it's one thing that you go to the dentist at two o'clock and you are there until four o'clock and you are not able to work for two hours then. And it's another thing, obviously, that you have sometimes uh, documents that take longer to translate and documents that take sh a shorter time to translate because they are easy to translate. This, this happens. And machine learning is, is, a, is a really good thing to, to learn about the, the, the correlations between this. But the one thing that is like the elephant in the room is that you are also working for others and you don't know how you are prioritizing this. So I think that machine learning can help predict translator availability, but only in, if the translators want to provide it that information somehow. And that needs to be provided, I think, in, a, in an anonymous way, because what you are interested in is not who this, other, who this translator is working for other than you. What you're interested in is when are these translators available? When would they uh, refuse to take a job just because they have a job from somebody else? Yeah, totally makes sense. Thank you so much. Um, Chris, do you have any questions? Yeah, right yeah. So, so I'm a marketer, right? I run Boulder SEO Marketing. We help uh, companies uh, on a global scale getting found through the search engines, right? Get those people to their websites. From a business perspective, right? That's our job to help them get people to their website. Uh, I'd love to hear about who does uh, header your solutions. Who does it make sense? Like, is there like a too small or a too big? And then also uh, maybe to all of you panelists, what are the the cost savings? Right, we're replacing humans with a technology. So, from a business perspective, that's what, what I'm interested in hearing. Um, yeah. So Chris, you, you asked me, um, what is the right size of company yeah. appropriate for our solution as far as providing this, this automated multilingual customer support solution? And we, of course, are interested in um, tackling the enterprise level companies because this is where we get a lot of volume and a lot of learning as well. But if you think about it, staffing up native speaking support agents um, across all of the languages that you need to support is an expensive proposition. And so our solution equally helps smaller companies, especially today when to expand, you kind of have to go global. Smaller companies often can't um, staff up and don't have the resources to provide multilingual customer support. So our solution enables them to just do it without staffing up. So I would say both. I mean, often companies will also use our solution as a vacation solution. So they may have staffed up native speaking support agents in China, but um, they're just entering into the Romanian market and don't really want to staff up in Romania until they understand the volumes there. So our solution can kick in. It can also kick in for their Chinese group during Chinese New Year when half of their staff is out. So, you know, we're not really limited to really large companies or really small companies. Um, it, it can be applied to either. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and I can see. So we're getting more and more requests to search engine optimize uh, help content. Mm. So, yes, that's you know, critical. Every call that the yep. company doesn't get, we, you know, every call costs money, right? Mm -hmm. so this is really, uh, I'd love to maybe do a, 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 an interview with you that we record where we just talk about that, right? How to reduce cost. In customer support so it's yeah. an interesting topic yeah uh, yes yeah, so you answer my question um in terms of gosh I, i'd love to maybe istuan if you do you have any numbers on like cost savings uh, anything to that um, i do have some definitely i mean i uh, i think that there are some like in the process automation space I mean, the, the best so far that I've seen is 50% on a certain workflow. Wow. Uh, this is like, in reality, I think that if you get to that 
like extreme uh, degree, then you can actually, I think, get 10 times the work done. So in the reality, I think we can get to 1,000 uh, percent of, uh, of productivity boost. Uh, but the, the idea is more about scaling up uh, rather than real cost saving, because in the end, you are working with translators. And process automation is not saving on the translator costs. It is making the work of project managers more scalable. That's the idea. But even, even here, it's not about like you save the costs. It's just that you use the same resources to do other things. So yeah, obviously this ROI calculation is always a very uh, yeah. shaky everywhere, I believe. Yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense. James, back to you. All right, um, I think I have one question. Um... So most companies are now crawling blogs, really like resources, you know, the polls as well as recent news outlet article, you know, basically um, across various domain. Basically what we have here is that we have a bunch of noises on the contents that preventing for training machine translation and also have a better MTP output. Um, what sort of NLP solution that Andy would you provide to support this type of um, um, this issue that when we're trying to train um, machine learning or this machine translation? Um, I think the, the difference, James, could you repeat that again? Sorry, I've been chatting with Mikolos. Could you repeat the question again? Because yeah, I, I mean, caught the yeah. loud tail end. Yeah, of course. So most companies are now crawling blogs, really like resources. Right, yeah. right. I saw that. Yes, yeah. Um, so the answer is basically the whole of the internet, because what we're trying to do is to build a comprehensive model, not one that's actually tuned to a specific domain. So the fact that the data can be dirty is actually irrelevant, um, because the probability calculations actually overcome that. What's more important for us is to have it to be comprehensive. That's the main thing. I see. I and see. you can't, you know, and that's a big difference between ILVS and NMT. Uh, NMT, you actually want to tune it based on a specific domain, so you get the best quality. With ILVS, we want to cash to actually um, throw the net as widely as possible so that we can catch all probabilities mm -hmm. because the data we're dealing with is everything it's not say for company xyz we're dealing with everybody's translation requirements so everything from gaming companies through to uh, life science you know pacemaker um, repair instructions so as wide as possible is the very very best way of doing that I see. Then how does the content, let's say from technology point of view, that we need a technology terminology, how does your vector space know that this terminology is not coming from a, let's say, a health and science or biology? How does it know the differences between a term that needs to use for tech versus biology? Okay, um, it can cope with both. Um, and you have to invert the question on its head. Um, <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> which is the beauty of the tool, uh, of the technique. It, it just it doesn't matter because it's the question that you pose is the most important one rather than the answer that you're looking for. So it, it will know within the context that you're dealing with which is the most appropriate thing to actually uh, provide. Because we are not feeding the system, but we're querying the system. So if you if we were feeding the system, we would want to know absolutely that this widget um, is a widget in say uh, a pacemaker. Um, but because what we're doing is we're analysing the translation output, what we want to do is to first of all identify which is the most probable translation for widget in the target, and there the widest possible net is the best way of doing this because it gives us the most probable way of achieving a hit mm -hmm. um, than um, the other way around. So it, it's the fact that we are analyzing, and I think that's a key thing to remember about ILVS. We're not translating, 
we are analyzing the translation so we can look for errors we can look for positions of words and phrases we can predict which words are coming up next based on the content that's been fed to us so far so that's that's the biggest difference you have to kind of reverse the thinking thank you thank you you mentioned that the content is coming from internet but the question that one of the audience asks is, what are the drawback or risk in regards to sharing resources while processing intellectual property from multiple companies? Okay, uh, one very, very important thing, we would never actually train on proprietary data. We only train on publicly available internet. That's it. Never anything, never customer data, never customer data, just the whole, and that's another reason for actually using the internet. It's available it's publicly available it's not copyrighted mm -hmm. and we would not um actually access or you know train copyrighted material for use by other for other companies companies are like two-year-olds they don't like sharing for a start <laughs> <laughs> if you have had children you'll know what that means um <laughs> <laughs> but um it's the fact that um, we can build this comprehensive model based on the whole of the internet. And that's the beauty of the internet. In the end, it is a fantastic resource. I know it gets abused and people, like with all human endeavors, um, people misuse it. But it is there, it's out there, it's available. And we build this fully comprehensive model based on all of this data, human output. And we can, and because we are querying, we're not translating, we're just analyzing data, then the accuracy of the initial training isn't that important. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that we can, with a higher degree of probability, work out that word A is in fact word B in the target, or that phrase C is phrase C in the target. That's what we're looking for. And to do that, you need to be able to work on probabilities. So, you know, the, the great mathematicians like Blaise Pascal or the Reverend Bayes are, are, kind of, are icons here because they allow us to do all of this kind of investigative work. Because what we're doing is investigative work, analyzing translations. We're not translating, we are analyzing the translation. That's the key message to get across. I see. And you use a vector, like one too many vector to map yeah. out other yeah. vectors. Yep. It's, it is amazing. You, when you see the 300 values, the real values, uh, and you do cosine trigonometric um, calculations based on them, it's quite uh, amazing. And it is actually showing you the hidden links between words. I um, mean, you know, like I mentioned, you know, uh, if Einstein's a scientist, then, what, you know, what is Lionel Messi? Uh, but you can also do things like if Paris is to France, then what is to Turkey? Um, things like that. So, uh, as I mentioned, we are just beginning to scratch the surface. I don't, people may have heard OpenAI company, which oh, yes. is partly funded by Elon Musk, and the CPT3 engine. A CPT free engine, you, you give it a sketch of an article, it will actually write a grammatically accurate article that's very convincing. Yeah, right there, yeah. It uses vector space. Phenomenal. That, that Phenomenal. uses vector space because it is able to leverage these kind of hidden you know, um, links between mm -hmm. words that aren't immediately obvious when you do a initial say computer analysis of text one last question is you know we all mentioned about english using training english from other internet question from julia yeah. is that the elephant in the room is not the source text to be translated it's non-native um english or non-native language what do you think about non-native language? Are there a shaking language that needs to be analyzed and trained? Um, well, we, in terms of English written by non-natives, yes, not native speakers. Yeah, non-native non-native English. So basically, like speakers. Spanish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would say that a, a, a large proportion of 
the internet is written by non-native English speakers. Uh, the official language for the European Union is Euro-English. Um, it, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. The more data we have, the better, um, because it allows us to analyze all of the possible outcomes. What I never cease to be amazed at is quite often the high quality of non-native English speakers um, out, you know, writing the output. English is uh, kind of unique. It belongs to a family of Creoles. It really is a fusion of medieval French um, and Middle English. Um, uh, I've constantly described it as a, um, in English as a Romance language, pretending <laughs> to be a Germanic one, <laughs> where 60% of the vac vocabulary is in fact Romance based and 6% is Greek. Um, so it's only about 29% is Germanic, so it's long ceased to be. But one of the characteristics of curls is that they have a very primitive morphology and it means that you can learn a certain level of English much more easily than other languages because it seems that there is a level of primitiveness in terms of English grammar you can get away with and still communicate effectively. After that, it really is like all languages, like Mandarin, where immensely, it's a lifetime's work. Um, I was born in the UK, but my parents are Polish and I'm t totally 100% bilingual, um, written, spoken, um, and I appreciate the differences between, say, English and Polish, which is a devilishly difficult language, not quite as difficult as Hungarian, <laughs> uh, which my grandmother spoke, but uh, bad enough. <laughs> um, but it, it doesn't matter. Um, it, it really, because we are basically gathering together all these resources to be able to analyze the output. It doesn't matter on the quality mm -hmm. of, you know, um, of the, the source. Okay. The, the more, the better, because it gives us more material to work with. And really with ILVS, grammatical errors don't come into into account. Um, even spelling errors um, can be identified. I see. Thank you so much, Nancy. Yes. I know that we run out of time. We have so much to discuss, but I know the time is running right now. So first, thank you so much, Andy, Heather, and Ishvan for panelists. Um, audiences, you know, I think we heard it all right. This is awesome for the next generation of ILBS. Please take a look at it and let us know if you have any questions. Back to you, Chris. Uh, hey, James. Thanks so much for moderating this panel. Uh, I couldn't have done it the way you did it. Uh, panelists, thanks so much. We could talk for this like on and on and on. Maybe we'll have a follow-up. Uh, I'll ask you know, the audience in the follow-up email what are the topics they would like to hear. It's a cool thing to do, right? It's very casual. Uh, I'd like to thank NIMSI for organizing, co-organizing the event. Uh, we had a lot of interest. The recording will be sent to everybody, uh, hopefully before the end of the week. Um, yeah, that was a blast. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, let's do this again sometime soon, right? Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good okay, day. Thank you. Thank you, thank James. You. Thank you, Chris. Bye, thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.